Hi, I'm Professor David Atley, and this is Topics in Astronomy. Thanks for joining me. In today's video, I'll be talking about some basic numeracy that's important for a lot of the fundamental sciences. If you've somehow stumbled into this video uh, without being part of an introductory science class of some kind, this might not be the video for you. There are plenty of other videos in this series that go over fun topics that are more closely related to astronomy, but this is mostly going to be about dealing with numbers. Um, so if you're not actually in a science class, you might want to jump on to the next video in the series. If you're still here, I assume that that's on purpose. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first topic is scientific notation. Um, scientific notation is a really useful tool in the scientists and engineers toolbox that lets us write either very large or very small numbers in a compact way. Um, this has a number of important benefits. It means that we can drop off insignificant digits, junk digits that are produced by our instrumentation. That's actually pretty common. Um, so if you do a calculation with your calculator, um, you might get a bunch of zeros at the end. Um, if you do calculations in the computer, it's actually very common to get a bunch of digits that are sort of meaningless. Um, like I think three is impossible to express exactly in floating point notation. I think it's actually like two with a bunch of nines after it and some other junk. But there are numbers like that. And so you can have a bunch of physically meaningless digits that nevertheless come out of a computer calculation. It's also really useful, even if all of the digits are significant, to be able to do arithmetic with very large numbers in a fairly easy way, and to maybe round that a little bit, even if all of the digits are physically meaningful, maybe they're not necessarily useful for the calculation we're doing. So that's going to let us drop off a bunch of digits to write things in a more natural way. How does this work? What we do is we effectively move the decimal point in a number. So we take this decimal point right here, and we move it to the left, and we move it left, in this case, 10 spaces. So this number, 1357 blah blah blah, we can turn that into scientific notation. It becomes 1.36, because I've rounded, times 10 to the 10 power. So we move 10 decimal places, and that number 10 ends up being the exponent in my exponential term. And then the actual value from these first three digits here gets encoded into the number out front here, which technically is called the mantissa. One of the things that I had to do to do that translation from just a string of numbers into scientific notation is to round the least significant digit in my expression. It's important to remember when you're doing science to round properly. So when we take a number like 3.1492 blah blah blah, maybe we only want to have two decimal places in our expression because those are the only significant digits. So we are interested not in this whole number that's in my example, but only in the three leading digits. So I'll take this and I'll say, okay, so I'm gonna have 3.14, but then I'm gonna look at the next digit in the chain, which is a nine. And if the first digit that I'm dropping is greater than or equal to five, I'm going to round up the least significant digit that I'm keeping. So what that means effectively for this example is that 3.14, nine, I'm gonna round that 
and that's going to turn into 3.15. So when you're writing down numbers in a lab or on a homework assignment, make sure that you're rounding appropriately. Let's say that the number across the bottom has only three significant digits. So I'm going to translate that number across the bottom into scientific notation so that it has the proper number of significant digits, and I want to make sure that I round correctly. So first, let's find the three significant digits in this number, and it's the, going to be the largest three digits that are non-zero. So they're going to have the largest place value. That's these three right here, 137. So I'll take 1375 and I'm going to round that, and that's going to be 138. And then I also need to figure out how many times I'm going to move my decimal point. I'm going to take my decimal point here and I'm going to start moving to the right now. So I'm going to go right instead of left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven places. So because I'm moving to the right instead of to the left, I'm going to get a negative exponent. And this number is going to turn into 1.38 times 10 to the negative 11. And that's my translation of that big long number across the bottom into scientific notation with the right number of significant digits and properly rounded. Now, once we've got numbers in scientific notation, it gives us a good thing that we can write down into our lab notebook. It saves some space, it's easy to read, so it gives us a sense of the relative size of the number. But if we have to translate that back into long form every time we want to do any arithmetic, it's kind of useless. In fact, it's even worse than useless because it's going to tend to make us make mistakes because we'll have that extra step. But fortunately, we can do arithmetic with numbers in scientific notation without having to go back to long form. And we're going to do that by grouping like terms. So, for example, I'm going to take the two leading terms, the mantissas, A and B here, and if I'm multiplying my two numbers in scientific notation, I'm going to multiply the mantissas, the numbers out front. So my product of these two initial numbers is going to be a times b, that goes out front, times, and then I'm going to group the exponential terms. So I'll take those exponentials, 10 to the x, and 10 to the y, and I'm going to group those together too, so I'll get 10 to the x times 10 to the y. And what's that product going to look like? Well, I'll have my mantissa, that just stays a times b, times an exponential term. Now, here's a question for you. What do I do with this expression? What happens if I'm multiplying two numbers in exponential notation like this? Pause the video, try and remember, answer this question. Okay, did you pause? So what's the answer? Hopefully you said that you're going to add the exponents. So the exponential term for my product here is going to be 10 to the x plus y. 
Got it? Okay, let's get rid of that. What if instead of multiplying, I want to divide? So that's my second example. You'll notice instead of multiplying two numbers together, I'm going to be dividing them. I'll do exactly the same thing. I'm going to group the like terms, so I'll grab the mantissas, A and B, but now I'm going to divide them instead of multiplying like I did in the previous example. So I'm dividing my numbers and I'm going to divide my mantissas. And then the same thing for my exponential terms. I'm going to group my exponentials. So I'll get 10 to the x divided by 10 to the y. Once again, pause the video. What happens when I simplify this expression? I'll wait. Okay, hopefully you pause the video and you have an answer and Ideally, you came up with the correct answer, which is that the answer to this division is going to be a divided by b times 10 to the x minus y. Now, People sometimes ask me, like, how do you get away with this? Um, so the, the multiplication is easy. There's lots of multiplication there. Um, so why does the division sort together like this? So let me rewrite my initial division using a slightly different notation. So I'm going to take this initial step here, and instead I'm going to rewrite that using fractional division notation. So a times 10 to the x divided by b times 10 to the y. And I can rearrange this fraction if I want. I can say that this is a over b times 10 to the x over 10 to the y, I've just taken that multiplication and split it into two independent pieces that give me two different fractions. And you'll notice that this expression here that I just wrote down is mathematically identical to this. So that's why I can get away with doing my scientific notation division in this way. So remember, when you're multiplying exponents, you're going to, or when you're multiplying exponential factors, you're going to add the exponents, so x plus y up here. And when you're dividing exponential terms, you're going to subtract the exponents. So down here, you get x minus y. Okay, so let's look at an example. What if we're multiplying? 3 times 10 to the 7 by 2 times 10 squared. Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to group the like terms, right? So take a minute, pause this video. If you have some scratch paper or something around, maybe you want to write down an answer, but try and think through what you think the answer is going to be. I'll wait for a second while you pause. Okay, let's work through the answer. So we're going to group the like terms, and we'll get 3 times 2 times 10 to the 7 times 10 squared, which is 6 times 10 to the ninth power. So hopefully that was your answer too. Let's try a division. We're going to do the same thing. So take a minute, pause the video, try and work through the answer, and then start it up again and I'll go through it with you.
Did you get an answer? Okay, so let's work this together. Once again, grouping like terms. So mantissas, five and two. Now we're dividing instead of multiplying. So we're gonna get five divided by two times, and now we'll do the exponential terms, 10 to the eight divided by 10 to the negative three, which equals five over two, that's two and a half, times 10 to the eight minus negative three. So be careful with your negative signs here. And if you're subtracting a negative, hopefully you remember from high school that that's the same as adding. So that's going to be 10 to the 11. So the answer here at the end of the day is 2.5 times 10 to the 11 power. All right, that's it for my initial discussion of scientific notation. Let's now look at some calculations that might come through in a basic astronomy or physics class. The tools that I'm using here will also be useful for things like chemistry. Chemistry can also sometimes benefit from looking at ratios, uh, but I teach astronomy and physics, so that's what I'm going to be thinking about. So let's say we have a really basic scenario. You've got a car and a truck. They're sitting together at a red light. The light turns green. They peel out. They both immediately hit their final speeds. The car gets up to 60. The truck's going 45. And after two hours, um, so it's a very long road with no red lights, um, how much farther has the car gone than the truck? Chances are, if you take a second to think about this, you'll come up with an answer pretty quickly. Uh, most students immediately arrive at the right answer without thinking about it that much, and the correct answer is 30 miles. Um, so the car is going to travel 120 miles in two hours because it's going 60 miles per hour for two hours. So two times 60 is 120. The truck travels 90 miles in the same time, and so the difference is 30 miles. To actually do this properly, we rely on an equation from physics that says that distance, so the distance that you've traveled, is equal to speed times elapsed time. Distance equals speed times time. Okay, well that's easy enough. Why do we have to do anything special with this? Well, let's look at a slightly different formulation of a similar question. So we've got the same car, the same truck, they're traveling the same speeds, but now I'm not going to tell you the time. I want you to compare the relative distance traveled by the car and the truck regardless of how long the time has passed. And this might seem weird, but there are problems like this that come up in astronomy and it also gives us a way in to a really important tool, the method of ratios. And that's how we're going to approach this problem. Ratios give us a good way of judging relative size. They do a couple of things that are useful when solving problems. One is they can let us eliminate nuisance variables or things that we don't know, like in this example, time. And they can also let us eliminate really big numbers that we might know, like the speed of light, or really small numbers like, say, the electric charge, and give us a way of comparing two quantities without having to go through and do all of the arithmetic with really big or really small numbers, because sometimes things just cancel out, as you'll see. So let's take that example equation, distance equals speed times time, and see how it would apply in this situation. And this method that I'm about to show you is really useful for a lot of questions in astronomy and physics. So if you see a question that says something like, how much larger is A than B? 
chances are this method of ratios will let you get a good answer that you can express in a relatively easy way. How does this work? So let's say that I want to know how much bigger the distance traveled by the car is compared to the distance traveled by the truck. Now I don't know how much time has gone by, but I can try to use the method of ratios to get around that. So let's write the ratio of the distance traveled by the car to the distance traveled by the truck. So that ratio would look something like this. D car to D truck. Now, something that you often learn in like introductory algebra classes, but people sometimes forget, is that this ratio is exactly the same thing as this fraction. That's why I've written this fraction across the bottom of the slide. So let's clear that out. So this fraction, that's the ratio I'm interested in. But I have an equation that lets me rewrite the distance traveled by the car in terms of other variables. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to take this top of the fraction, d car, and I'm going to say, I know that distance equals speed times time. So the distance traveled by the car has to be equal to the speed of the car times the elapsed time. And that's all I've done. I've taken this equation and I've substituted in two equal things. So I've rewritten my initial fraction in this slightly different form. Now, what can we do with this? Why is this helpful? So take a second, pause the video, and see how you can simplify this fraction. Okay, are you back? Did you spot it? So how can we actually simplify this? Well, we have time on both the top and the bottom of the fraction. And because it's on the top and the bottom of the fraction, that time is going to cancel. And I'm left with the expression that says that the ratio of distances is the same as the ratio of speeds. So if I take my two speeds and I plug in my numbers, 60 miles an hour and 45 miles an hour, I will get an answer which is about 4 to 3. So if you simplify that fraction, 60 over 45, you'll get 4 thirds. So there's a ratio of 4 to 3 for the distance traveled by the car compared to the distance traveled by the truck. And this is useful in a lot of other contexts too. Let's look at a different example. Let's look at light traveling through the solar system. Pluto is farther from the Sun than the Earth is. And as a result, it takes light from the Sun longer to reach Pluto than it takes that same light to reach the Earth. It takes about eight minutes for light from the Sun to come from the Sun to the Earth, but it takes about five hours for that light to go from the Sun to Pluto. Now, if we wanted, we could go and we could look up the speed of light and we could calculate the actual distances and we could subtract um, but all that's really going to say is that Pluto is really far from the Sun. Using the method of ratios lets us figure out how much farther Pluto is compared to the Earth. So we're going to write a fraction that's the ratio of distances between the distance from the Sun to Pluto compared to the distance from the Sun to the Earth. And that's that initial fraction here. As before, distance equals speed times time. Now you'll notice I've done something a little sneaky here. I've substituted a different variable. 
Um, so by tradition, astronomers use the variable C to, in, well, physicists too, use the variable C to mean the speed of light. Um, that, the reason for that, um, I'm sure somebody knows, but I don't. It's just tradition. So we have C show up in both the top and the bottom of our fraction, which means that it will cancel. So those Cs cancel, and I end up with the distance to Pluto compared to the distance from the Sun to the Earth is the same as the ratio of those travel times. So then all I have to do is plug in those travel times, five hours versus eight minutes. I go through and I do the calculation, and I find out that Pluto is about or the ratio of the distance to Pluto compared to the distance to the Earth is 75 to 2. Or if you want to translate that into a decimal number, that's going to be about 37. So Pluto is about 37 times farther from the Sun than the Earth is. In this video, we've talked about a couple of important tools in the scientist's toolbox. Um, we went over scientific notation and rounding. We worked through some examples of how we can do arithmetic in scientific notation. So if you see two really big or really small numbers written in scientific notation, you can work with those without translating back to long form, which tends to lead to errors. And we've gone over some important applications in algebra like substitution and the method of ratios that can be really useful when solving problems in the physical sciences. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you found it helpful. You'll see some of these tools come back as we work our way through uh, my astronomy classes and when they do come back I'll remind you about the stuff that you learned here. Um, so hopefully by repetition you'll start to remember it and remember how to use these tools to solve problems in class. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon for another topic in astronomy.